And again, I will make this available so you can go back and watch it later if it helps, or if you have to check out a little early or whatever. The, um, okay, so I uh, just grabbed one of my old presentations. Well, some of it has some, well, it's all old now, most of the stuff, but it's newish in some parts. And so, um, just kind of give you a little bit of my science background. And then throughout this um, presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the process behind it a little bit more slow than what would be a normal science presentation so far, or so much, you know, like if you go watch, I don't know how many times science talks, but um, I'm gonna try to go a little slower. I'm trying to give you some of the background that maybe wasn't included in a typical science presentation. And so um, to give you a little bit of the joy in the background of being a scientist. Um, so if you want to know a little bit about me, um, I hear some, uh, make sure everybody's got their is muted. So, um, you know, I, like you all, a lot of you are undergraduates who are working on your undergraduate degree. You're getting some exposure to research, but a lot of what you're doing in your undergraduate degrees is kind of getting a breadth of classes. Um, you know, when you think about your freshman classes, it's a lot of just teaching to the masses, right? And then eventually as you go up into your upper division classes, you're getting into more of your specialty classes and you're now with students that are kind of more into the topics. And then that's what continues on if you decide to go to grad school. Um, you do your master's degree, um, like a place like Western or other schools. Um, that's what I did. I did my master's at a South at Southeast Missouri State University. So again, it was more of a this teaching comprehensive university. There's a lot of pros um, to doing your master's degree at a, at a university like ours or like I had, and that is um, they're probably getting a little bit more attention and it's a good stepping stone before maybe deciding to do either more graduate school or going into the job market. I think you get a, you know, just a little bit more of an easier easing into the research career at a university like ours usually. Again, a, a lot of what happens in, um, whether you're doing undergraduate research or end up doing graduate research, a lot of it has to come down, comes down to who your research advisor is. And in many regards, that's more important than the school you go to in, in a lot of the cases. So anyway, I did my undergraduate at, at a very small school called Park College at the time. It's now called Park University. And then I did my master's degree at Southeast Missouri State University. And I actually worked with fish biology and um, did um, looked at alarm pheromones in fish. And then I, um, during the summers, was trying to get some money. So I worked in St. Louis Public Health Department and uh, the county public. And so I was working with mosquitoes. And then I kind of got into the idea of maybe getting a PhD. I knew I wanted to get a PhD in the life sciences and I kind of leaned towards entomology after having this opportunity to work with mosquitoes for two different summers. And so the person there, I was an alumni from University of Arkansas and he pushed me to go to the University of Arkansas. And so initially I was gonna be a mosquito fighter, uh, but I ran into a guy named Gary Felton, who was my PhD advisor at University of Arkansas. And um, I was really lucky to get into his lab. He was a very uh, respected scientist um, in the, my field. And he's now the um, department head of Penn State University. So if anybody was around last year at the, um, what was it, the Midwest Ecology and Evolution Conference, Meek. I think, I think Lindsay was there. I believe Kylie and Morgan might have been there. Is that right? I didn't hear the name of it. Say again. Were you at Meek last year? No. Was anybody at Meek, Kylie or Morgan? I went there. 
So you got to see Gary Felton? Yeah, I did. Yeah, so he was my PhD advisor. Um, I wish they had pointed that out, but <laughs> but anyway, I'm neither here nor elsewhere, you know. But um, so I did. It kind of becomes when you work with somebody intensely on research, it kind of you kind of become part of this family. I know Lindsay's getting a little bit of that experience, even from her honors project. Um, so you you start, especially for a PhD, you end up kind of. Um, you always kind of feel like you're the offspring a little bit of your PhD advisor. And then if you have lab mates or kind of like um, cousins or brothers or something, again, in a very loose, intellect, but the intellectual sense, it gets it's that kind of intense of an experience. Um, so anyway, my claim to fame was when I worked in his lab was I got in the caterpillar spit. And so that's what this picture is showing you here is this caterpillar is about to munch. And of course he's, or she, this caterpillar is drooling spit. And it actually is a cartoon that came from a research, one of my research articles because it had enough notoriety to make it into a very prestigious journal called Nature, the British journal Nature. It's one of the most prestigious journals out there. It's maybe, you know, you got a one in a hundred chance of getting your article accepted there. So it was a really big deal. And I got it from doing my, during my PhD. And um, so then there was, you know, like Science Direct and all these other news sources for science um, put this picture together. Anytime you do a big article, they like to do something like that. So the neat thing about being a scientist is you know, I'm not going to be able to dunk a basketball or do something, some crazy other skill, but here's something I can be one of the world's best in. Does that make sense? As a scientist, you can be the, the world's best in your particular area, specific, especially when you narrow it down. So at one point <clears throat> when I was doing this research and I came up with these results in a lab one night, I was the first person in the world to know it. And that's a pretty cool thing to, to, to discover something and be the first to make that discovery. <clears throat> now again, um, um, even small discoveries are discoveries. And, and then your job as a scientist, ultimately, you know, it's not the easiest part, but it's to write your publications and manuscripts. So anyway, I hope that gives you a little bit of a taste about why it's cool to be a scientist. And so I've actually finished around 40 students, master graduate students at Western in the biology department. And I think that makes me the highest uh, faculty member to, uh, on the completion rate currently by quite a pretty big margin. And so that's my little pat on my back. And so I, a lot of me students, my students have gone on to get PhDs. Um, um, be successful as a technician of some sort as well with their master's degree directly. Um, several have gone on to medical school or dental school or, and some are teachers and stuff like that. You might not know this, but Mary Anderson was actually uh, one of my master's students from back in the day. Um, so anyway, what caterpillar do I work with the most? was this one here, it's called Helicoverpus zea. Now, here's another thing that you might wanna jot down in your notes somewhere. There are some caterpillars and insects that are herbivores that are called generalist. And then there's some that are called specialist. Generalist is an insect that can feed on just about anything. Okay. And so, well, or a lot of things. And so this caterpillar here, Helicoverpa zea is one of the most worst pests in the United States and North America. And then some of its cousins like Helicoverpa amagera or, or Spidopterus of various sorts, they're all closely related, Noctuidae is the family, are among the worst pests worldwide, whether it be in Africa or China or Europe, they cause most of the serious economic, much of the economic damage on 
major cropping systems like corn and soybeans and things like that. So this caterpillar feeds on everything. It's actually very cannibalistic. So if you ever open up an ear of corn, and if, this would be like sweet corn or something like that, and there, you probably don't necessarily encounter this, but occasionally you'll find a single caterpillar munching away. It's most likely this caterpillar here. And there's silks that are on the corn. If you guys have seen corn on the cob, you've seen the silks. The, the moth, because these are moths, the mother will lay the eggs on the silk and then the little caterpillars will hatch and crawl inside the, the husk. And the husk obviously kind of protects them from being, you know, attacked by predators because inside it, well, they often eat each other. And so often you might have a batch of 20 eggs and you might only have one caterpillar out of the batch. Kind of a strange thing, but we'll get into cannibalism a little later. So again, that's a generalist caterpillar. Now there's also specialist caterpillars. Specialists are caterpillars that feed on specific families of plants. So like this was the, remember I talked about the tobacco hornworm? So here's why we call it a horn. See that little spike at the end? And so this is the tobacco hornworm. It's a specialist on what we call solanaceous plants. And again, I'm hoping you're taking at least some semi notes or at least watch the video again. But solanaceous plants, are, does anybody know what solanaceous plants are? You can already guess tobacco, right? Well, you can see underneath. Tomato plants, potato plants, nightshades of various sorts. Those are all in that family, solanaceous plants. Solanaceae. Um, just, uh, just in case you're not familiar with much about insects, remember insects have how many legs? Six. But what about when we look at these caterpillars, what do we see here? Well, there's one, two, and these are pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever, it's a lot, right? Is those all real legs? Remember insects have six true legs. And so the true legs are these up here. So there's two pairs of three. This again, this is this quick familiarization. If you're not familiar with insects that much. So there's, this is a pair, one, two, three pairs. Those are our six legs. We call those pro legs, by the way. And just assume that anything I talk about is something I might ask at some point in the oral exam or written exam. So just try to make sure you're kind of familiar when I, when I stop to tell you this kind of stuff. Does anybody know what these holes are here? I know Morgan probably knows what. I, what are these holes on each of these segments? They look like little black dots. I can pick on Morgan. I thought you took entomology, right, Morgan? Yeah, are they like they're spiracles? Yes, good job. Yeah, those are spiracles. So um, what are the spiracles for? To they help them they want to breathe, O2. Yeah. So insects, again, I know this is really basic, but just in case you realize insects don't breathe, they don't have little lungs and they're not, when you see a house fly flying around, it doesn't stop and start, right? It's, not, it's actually breathing through holes called spiracles. And so the, there's little tubes that go through their body called trachea. So anyway, that's one that you'd be familiar with. And we call the, man, the mouth parts mandibles. So anyway, that, so what is the generalist again? Caterpillar or insect, herbivore that feeds on anything, just about specialists feed on specific families. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, most insects are actually specialists, not generalists. So it's actually more rare to be a generalist. Almost everybody or every insect is a specialist. It's kind of funny when you think about careers, most people are specialists too, right? Um, it's easier to focus in evolutionarily on one set of chemical defenses than it is to try to live on tobacco defenses, corn defenses, tomato defenses, and so forth. Um, there's also, um, these were cabbage butterflies. They can feed on 
well, cabbage and broccoli and Arabidopsis, these are all kind of that same family. So these are some of the insects that I've worked with. Um, so again, um, I did my uh, PhD, as you can imagine, pre-9-11. Uh, is anybody born in 2001 or is that too early yet still for, or most of you are still born after 2001? Or was that, when was it 2011 or 9-11? Does anybody remember, was that 2001, 2002? But anyway, most of my research was done then. I mean, some of this stuff I'm telling you right now. So again, as I told you, I was kind of an expert in, in spit, insect spit. So what do we mean when we talk about spit? And how do you get at the spit of insects? And is spit even important to humans? Does anybody else want to make a suggestion? Is insect, insect spit important to any of you? <laughs> Caterpillar spit specifically. Does Audrey or Carly have a suggestion? Cameron, I'm just reading names, of course. <laughs> it's easy for me to pick on Lindsay because Lindsay, I know she's quick to willing to talk, but anybody else want to hazard a guess? Does anybody ever wear caterpillar spit in here? If you had the money? Well, silk is, for example, is caterpillar spit coming from the silk moth. And so, um, anyway, the silk moth is um, example of spit. And the spit comes from this thing called a spinneret. And these come from big labial salivary glands. So these, these salivary glands are really huge in caterpillars. They'll travel down the body of the caterpillar. And I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. And so the spit actually will come out of the spinneret. Now, when they're really young and small, caterpillars, I guess caterpillars, you know, have a short lifespan. <laughs> but when they're small, neonates, they'll be crawling around and they'll actually leave a silk um, thread that'll go up into the sky and that'll help them to balloon. So they can actually float away from a plant that their mother laid their eggs on. So that's one benefit. So these are some things maybe to jot down what spit does. Spit can function as obviously for us making silk, um, clothing, um, it could help in ballooning for the caterpillars to help them float away. But it also has extra oral digestive factors so since they're spitting on their food and helping to digest it. So that's one thing it can do. Um, I was about to mention something else. Oh, when caterpillars go into cocoons, you know, they're putting silk around themselves. Um, spit comes from different sources. A lot of it comes from the mandibular salivary glands. So here's the mandibles. So this is what's chewing through the, the leaf material. And then here's the droplet of spit that you can see on a spinneret. Um, and so when researchers are researching this, a lot of times, especially more of the plant scientist types, when they first were getting into how does plant spit affect plant defenses? They would actually cause the caterpillar to upchuck by giving it a squeeze with forceps. So this is a caterpillar here. And this, would, this body would extend well beyond your computer screen. And this green goo, what do you think the green goo is, Lindsay? Uh, I mean, it says regurgitant. I mean, it's gotta just be like waste. Right. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's going to include their gut. So what's the problem with that? I mean, the guts are coming in, out of the body. That's dangerous. Well, so let's, so how do we mimic insect herbivory? We're going to get into this in a second, but if I wanted to make it, so how would you, well, I guess I'm kind of giving a hint. Can anybody help describe how would you pretend like you're a caterpillar feeding on a plant? How about you, Jacqueline? I'm not sure, to be honest. Well, what do we know about plant defense or 
when a caterpillar feeds on a plant, we know it's going to do what? It's going to tear up that leaf material, right? Yeah. So what would you use potentially? It doesn't have to be anything special. It could be anything. Here's an example. We could start cutting up leaves, right? Trimming away just for some nail clippers, scissors. Um, anything that can kind of give a little bit of damage to the plant, like a caterpillar would be, would be examples of ways to um, damage the plant to mimic herbivory, the wounding part. Now, it's not going to be perfect, right? This isn't exactly a caterpillar, but you're kind of going more, but a caterpillar is slowly munching away at the leaf, right? Well, um, the, so, you know, the, you know, it's munching away. Well, it's, it's also spitting on the food. But the, the, pre, the early researchers would grab this big green goo, this regurgitant, put it onto the leaf and say, this is herbivory. It's the wounding, or at least you know, that's what they're trying to argue. And again, they got limitations. But the problem, as Lindsay kind of mentioned, is you might be including stuff that isn't really what they normally would secrete, right? You're not normally, when you're eating, you're not normally um, throwing up your food and then calling that spit, right? The spit, the, the true spit is the saliva in my salivary glands. So here are the salivary glands of caterpillars. And so this is a caterpillar that's heads up here. I've done a vertical cut and then opened it up. And so let me just give you a quick anatomy lesson on it. Um, of course, these, these metal things are forceps, or these are the forceps, these are the pins. And then these are the labial salivary glands. And this is what makes the silk. And it comes out of the spinneret that I was telling you about. It's kind of a watery, proteinish substance. And then these little ones here, there's two of them, are the mandibular salivary glands. And they actually come out through holes in the pores of the mandibular salivary glands. They tend to be more oily. Now, Morgan had already mentioned the spiracles they end up going into these little tubes called trachea. So these are the trachea or the tracheoles of the caterpillar. So those are all little holes that are feeding the muscles and tissues with oxygen because they're good, they don't have lungs or anything like that. Um, the white tissue here looks like fat. It's called the fat body. The fat body is like the liver one of the functions is like a liver, it actually does some detoxification. And then this is just a tube. Well, the, well, not just a tube, it's obviously the digestive tract. And it's more complex once you get into the, the, the cells themselves. You have epithelial tissue, you have even a basic, a basket, a basket, excuse me, a basket inside it that's like a netting that we call the paratropic matrix that actually protects the, the um, gut from being damaged from the leaf material. But what are you getting from this picture? The labial salivary glands are huge, probably have a pretty big importance to the function of this caterpillar survival. And it's probably more ideal that if we talk about spit, we wanna talk about what specific aspects of spit, oral secretions, that um, are important for these plant defenses. So again, we're kind of, so the point of this talk is to kind of get you familiar with some of the research that we do in our lab, and that'll at least be in part related to your research projects, or the, particularly in class ones as we figure things out as we go. Um, so I want to give that background and plant herbivory and plant herbivore interactions, this is kind of one of the, the big areas, the spit stuff. So as you can imagine, saliva has lots of functions. Um, 
digestion, silk, all that kind of stuff I already mentioned. There's lots of different enzymes in caterpillar saliva, or insect saliva. And um, this might not be a particularly good function for insects, but what did we see in that video? When the caterpillar was feeding on the plant, um, it would release an SO, the plant would release an SOS signal that would actually help attract predators to come and find the eggs and attack the caterpillar, if you remember. So those are indirect defenses. The saliva helps to trigger that. So the actual spit, the plant can pick up on the actual spit and then release a specific volatile blend that's attractive to particular predators. Is everybody following that? So that means one caterpillar, one species of caterpillar might turn on a different set of volatiles in the plant that are attractive to a different set of predators and then a different caterpillar might turn on a different set of, of salivary factors that attract predators. So anyway, a different set of predators. So it's, it can be quite, um, you know, like a signature specifically. It's, so it's really remarkable if you think about it. So that means if I went in with this and started cutting the leaves, the volatile blend might be different than the actual caterpillar because the caterpillar had the spit. Now, what is the name of the caterpillar that I work with? Helicoverpa zea. Obviously, I'm hoping you're familiar with scientific names at this point, but you always either what? Italicize or put a, um, um, or put a line underneath it. Well, the enzyme that was most important for this caterpillar is called glucose oxidase. This is an enzyme that makes hydrogen peroxide and um, gluconic acid. So H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. So this enzyme, glucose oxidase, as you, I'm hoping you're familiar with how enzymes work. Anytime you see ACE, you know it's an enzyme. And so it breaks down glucose. So the enzyme is right here. Glucose oxidase breaks down or converts glucose with the aid of oxygen and water into gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, my job as a PhD student was to figure out what is this enzyme potentially doing for the caterpillar? So could you imagine, and you might do this if when you, if you decide to become a grad student and do research. And I said, your job as a grad student to graduate is to come up with research that can help me to understand your advisor understand what this enzyme is doing for the caterpillar. How, and what would be some of, you know, you have to come up with hypothesis. Because why is this, I mean, think about it. Why is there 50% of the protein that's secreted made up of glucose oxidase in the salivary glands? It must be important to be the object, obviously something you would think. And so, well, one thing we know about hydrogen peroxide is what? When you scratch yourself, got a little wound, um, your caregiver, your mom or your dad or parental unit or guardian, grandma, whatever, would pour on some hydrogen peroxide potentially to clean out that wound. The idea is it kills bacteria. So maybe it's antibacterial for a caterpillar. That might be a hypothesis that me would have to test as a PhD student. Eventually you're gonna find out, especially from your readings, we found out that the hydrogen peroxide is actually important in the plant's immune system. And I'm using the immune system very loosely because remember the immune system has antibodies and antigens and things like that. That plants have an immune-like system where this glucose oxidase can actually react and um, trigger um, a set of chemicals. And that's what we're gonna get into next in a moment. Well, right here, actually. Um, so this one is important. This graph here is one of the most important. It's a simple flow chart, but it's one of the most important things to kind of grasp. Plants, and this is, a, what I'm telling you here is very universal in plants. 
This is ancient uh, plant defense pathways. So they're, they're ubiquitous. I mean, they, you can find this in just about any plant you can think of. You can find this in algae as well. So this has been around a long time. There are two major hormones involved in plant defenses. So one of them is known as jasminate and or jasmonic acid. So jasminate or jasmonic acid, that could be written either way. Salicylic acid or salicylate. So these are the two major hormones. I mean, it's like talking about testosterone, estrogen and, and animals. Those are major hormones. Jasmate and salicylic acid are major hormones in plants, all plants, as far as we know. Um, they obviously, you can do different things, but basically the jasmate, let's say it's tobacco plants. If I was the plant hormone, if I was to cut the plant, the tobacco plant, start wounding the tobacco plant, the jasmate hormone would increase from the wounding. And then that jasmate hormone would actually, of course, it'd be downstream through a variety of biochemical pathways, but that jasmate would ultimately trigger the induction, stimulate nicotine levels to rise in tobacco plants after wounding. So this is a typical of the, what we call the induced resistance pathway. Um, and so we'll get into more about plant herbivore defenses a little bit later, but this is the wounding and the herbiv more the chewing herbivore pathway. And then we have the systemic acquired resistance pathway, also known as SAR. So this is the IR, induced resistance, and the SAR. This is the pathway that's primarily effective against in plants against pathogens. So when your plant becomes infected with a bacteria, often this is the hormone that's turned on, salicylic acid or salicylate. And are you familiar with salicylic acid? Maybe biochemically, have you ever heard of acetyl salicylic acid? Well, acetyl salicylic acid is what? Aspirin. So aspirin um, is, it should be used for our headaches. So here's a plant, at least a derivative of this plant hormone that we use for our own ailments or a relief from ailments and reduction and in inflammation. Well, anyway, this triggers the plant pathogen defenses. And so if, again, if a plant is infected with a bacteria, this pathway is turned on. Now we haven't got into different types of insects much yet, but there are some insects like aphids and white flies that typically trigger this pathway as well. Now, the interesting thing about these pathways is there's a thing called crosstalk. That means that the hormones interact with each other. So let's say this plant is attacked and there's lots and lots of jasmine being built up. That can actually suppress the buildup of salicylic acid. So if jasmine's in high levels here, the plant will actually lower its salicylic acid and in often in many cases become more susceptible to a pathogen. And this is vice versa. If the plant was infected first with a bacteria or a virus, it would trigger um, the plant defense pathogens, really triggering it up highly and actually suppress the jasmine. And then the plant could actually become more susceptible to the caterpillars eating. So it wouldn't be able to trigger, trigger that plant defense. So in other words, we're talking about tobacco plants. If tobacco plants um, were infected with a virus, the salicylic acid levels would be really high and the jasmine may be really low and the caterpillar might be able to munch away on the plant and, and get away with not eating as much nicotine. Now notice what else is involved in the, the system acquired resistance pathway. H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is actually a systemic signal in the plant. And notice what the caterpillar makes. 
hydrogen peroxide. Does this help the caterpillar to trick the plant into forming a defensive system that's not effective? And that's what you're going to find out about when you read your paper and of course when we continue these lectures next week. And we, and we may have it set up to be a little bit more of discussion on some of that parts of it. So does anybody have any questions for the last minute of our class today? Again, the rest of the lecture will be, or for this class, because remember it's a three hour class or whatever, is for you to watch the video and write a summary on it. And then I will put a couple papers, short papers for you to read for next week under assignments. If anybody um, wants me to come back, just let me know now. Otherwise, I will see you next Tuesday at four o'clock. Feel free to email me anytime, of course. And then these lectures will be available um, on YouTube. Just to clarify, these notes that you have are on Western Online now, right? Yeah, the PowerPoint slides are, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Yep. All right, everybody. Um, I hope you had got some idea of what's going on. <laughs> It was fun visiting with you. Um, maybe we'll try to make a little bit more discussion this next time. Um, and again, don't wait till the last minute. 